We have new numbers regarding how much gold central banks are buying, 400 tons in Q3 this year. Records and numbers we haven't seen since the 80s. Uh, yet we don't know some of those mystery buyers. Obviously the theories are that are, that are they are Russia and China. I'm curious to get your thoughts on central bank record buying of gold here and how Russia and China fit into this puzzle here. It's a great question and we have the data um, now. Jim Rickards explores the strategic moves by China and Russia as they accumulate gold and what it could mean for the global dominance of the U.S. dollar. Is gold set to revolutionize the financial world? Join us as we delve into Jim Rickards' insights on the future of finance, the role of gold, and the implications for investors and economies worldwide. He also explores the complex relationship between gold reserves, currency markets, and the dollar's future as a reserve currency. With a clear and straightforward explanation, before listening, I have a request to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thanks. Now, China is non-transparent. Russia is much more transparent, although Russia is starting to be opaque a little bit because they're in a war. But uh, you can see the inflection point is 2010. So from 1970 to 2010, it's a long stretch, 40 years, central banks were net sellers. It didn't mean everybody sold everything, but Switzerland is down a thousand tons, U.S. was down a thousand tons after losing uh, you know, uh, 8,000 tons, or sorry, 11,000 tons between 1950 and 1970. It was down, down, down. 2010 was the year that central banks became net buyers. Now, it doesn't mean every central bank was buying gold. It does mean that they were selling a lot less and others were buying more. Uh, and some of the buyers are Mexico, Kazakhstan, Philippines, Vietnam. We know China's a big buyer. We don't know exactly how much Russia was a, as a big buyer. That is continuing. Now the new players, Iran, Iran's not transparent, but we know they're buying gold. Turkey uh, is buying a lot of gold. Uh, Japan had a bunch of gold all along. They never told anybody about one, literally one month, their reserves went from 600 tons to 900 tons. Well, you know the market. You, you can't buy 300 tons in, in a month, not, not one country in one order. But they had it all along, but they decided to reveal it, put it on their balance sheet. So uh, Americans don't seem to like gold. I'm not sure Canadians feel much differently or others around the world, uh, but central banks sure do. And I think that tells you something. Exactly, exactly. It, it absolutely does tell us something. You know, what are they preparing for, Jim? They're preparing for what we're talking about, which is uh, a, a world where uh, the, the dollar as a reserve currency will not be deposed overnight. But as a payment currency, there's a difference between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Right. Anything, anything can be a payment currency. If I want to pay you with baseball cards and bottle caps and you're okay with that, then it's a, it's a currency. So uh, when we see the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation right. Organization, OPEC Plus, uh, China individually, all these countries are the... the uh, uh, European, the Eurasian European e Economic Union, which is, you know, Putin's answer to the EU. All of these organizations are working on new payment systems right now, and they're going to start to roll them out this year and later. So that's going to be a, a radical change in how we pay for things. And I think that's such an important point you made, uh, Jim. And thank you for that because you're saying it, its status as a reserve currency is a completely different discussion. You're saying that's not going to go away overnight. Right. It took 30 years for sterling to be run off the road. It started in 1914 and with World War I. It was completed in 1944 with Bretton Woods. So that, that, the dollar did displace sterling, but it took 30 years. The thing is, people don't understand reserve currency. It's not, it's not as if the People's Bank of China has pallets of $100 bills stacked up in the basement. Reserve currency means a currency of denomination of securities. So the key to, so what China does have are treasury bills and treasury notes. So the key to being reserve currency is not the currency, it's the bond market. Do you have a large, safe, liquid bond market? And if you do, then people will, ha will buy those bonds. What else are they gonna do with the money? But that's, that's much harder to replicate. But if China is stockpiling, hoarding gold, not telling the numbers, are they planning to release some sort of, you know, cur a currency backed by gold? What, are they, no. what do they wanna do with it? Well, they can't have a currency backed by gold, at least not the Chinese yuan, because the problem is there is no Chinese yuan bond market of any size, number one. Number two, they have no rule of law. I mean, no, I wouldn't trust the Chinese or the Russians for that matter. Uh, and the U.S., the problem with the U.S. is that we had a good thing going. I've always said the world will not destroy the dollar. The United States will destroy the dollar through our own policy blunders. And when you freeze the assets of the Central Bank of Russia, I don't want to debate the war in Ukraine, that's a big subject. But when, when we freeze the assets of the central bank in Russia, and you're the central bank of Turkey, Saudi Arabia, China, you're like, hey, how do I know that next week the U.S. isn't going to not like something I did? 
Are they going to freeze my assets? Right. So little by little, yeah, at the margin, you get out of treasury notes, you get out of euros for that matter, and get into gold. So there is this displacement effect going on, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see China announce a, a big bump, maybe you know, 500 tons or more in their gold, gold reserve. I would say they already have it, they just haven't announced it. I want to bring up this article uh, from Bloomberg. There's a hidden risk to the global financial system embedded in the $65 trillion of dollar debt being held by non-U.S. institutions via currency derivatives. This is according uh, to the bank. For international settlements, the article goes on to say, a lack of information is making it harder for policymakers to anticipate the next financial crisis. Well, first of all, that article is exactly right. Uh, there, there is, we've been talking about recession, inflation, deflation, but the one thing we haven't spoken about yet, you kind of just referred to it, is there a global liquidity crisis coming? And a liquidity financial crisis is different from a recession. Sometimes you can have one without the other. Um, and, uh, you know, 1990 we had a recession, there was no crisis. 1998 we had a crisis, there was no recession. The economy was fine in 1998, but the, the financial world almost came to an end. Uh, sometimes they come together, and that's what happened in 2008. We may be looking at a scenario like that. By the way, 65 trillion in foreign currency derivatives, yeah. But try one quadrillion in total derivatives. I mean, that's that's foreign currency, and that was the focus of the BIS paper. But when you get into interest rate swaps and uh, commodity swaps and, and swaptions and all the rest, that's one quadrillion, which for people not familiar with the Q word, is a thousand trillion. So wow. you pointed to 65 yeah. trillion, and you're right, that's FX, but there's a thousand trillion or one quadrillion of derivatives off balance sheet of the banking system supported by collateral, a little sliver of collateral, and there's a dollar shortage and that's getting ready to implode. So, you know, we're not painting a rosy picture here, obviously, um, with all these moving pieces and question marks and, and, and whatnot. Um, you know, the global um, outlook uh, is pretty uh, gloom and doom, Jim, but I, I like that in your book um, you offer solutions or you know how can we get ahead so let's talk a little bit about this of how we can how we as an investor uh, get ahead prepare ourselves for what's ahead here well a couple things you can do one thing I would increase my cash allocation um, a lot of people hate cash they're like eh, it doesn't have any yield uh, why would I do that I'm missing out on you know, whatever Bitcoin or stocks or whatever um, cash is extremely valuable number one it performs very well in disinflation and deflation. Deflation, it could be your, even with a very low nominal yield, it, it can have a much higher real yield in a world where prices are going down. So it's a good deflation hedge. But more importantly, uh, cash gives you optionality. If taking everything we just described about a potential stock market crash that could be 30% or more, a global liquidity crisis that could be worse than 2008, I mean, there are plenty of signs of both of those things. Well, if you're the one with cash, first of all, you're not, you're not gonna lose money on cash. Uh, you will on stocks and other asset classes, but not cash. And then when this uh, drawdown comes, when this collapse comes, you're the one who can go shopping. You can go out on the wreckage and say, oh, well, here's a good company, it's down 90%, I'll buy some of that. By the way, uh, the person with the most cash in the world is Warren Buffett. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway has over $130 billion of cash. Now, why do they have that? The answer is, he's, Buffett sees the same thing I see, the same thing we're talking about right now, which is in a highly uncertain world, with a lot of vulnerabilities, and that's exactly what we're describing, that come home to roost, and that's how I see 2023, cash will preserve wealth and then give you the opportunity to pick up bargains. Um, I'd also have a slice of gold. Uh, I recommend 10%. People people always want to put words in your mouth. Go, Jim Rickard says sell everything and buy gold. I've never said that. I don't think it's a good strategy. 10%, yes. Now, if you have 10%, sit tight. Uh, it'll serve you well. If you don't, you might want to get some uh, some gold because a lot of what we're talking about is going to play out in foreign exchange markets.